Okay, I'd like to welcome you today to uh, our seminar. Well, I guess it's a lecture, actually, not a seminar. Um, my name is Martin Sanchez Jankowski, and I'm the chair of the Center for Ethnographic Research. Um, I would like to start off by asking you to check your cell phones to see if they're not quiet, since we have such a small room. Um, and we don't want to disturb the, the lecture as it goes on. I also want to thank the co-sponsors for this event, Berkeley Center for Social Medicine, as well as the School of Social Welfare. Uh, just to let the people here know, the format we usually have is that our presenter uh, addresses for about 45 minutes. Then we'll have a question and answer at a time. And when the question and answer time comes up, I actually come over here on the side and if you keep your hands up, I'll put you in the queue um, so that you don't have to put up your hands real quickly like a press conference for the president. <laughs> so that's what we'll do. Uh, and that will be the procedure that we'll follow. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today because he has a history with the Center for Ethnographic Research. He first became associated with it as an undergraduate, uh, as part of our undergraduate summer intern program. Um, and I believe, I hope we, uh, I hope we influenced him to go into this method. Um, and it, he followed this up by actually coming back and teaching the same course that he took when he was an undergraduate. So we have him as a graduate student who, who, who actually presented the course to other undergraduates. He went on from there to, uh, to do graduate work at UCLA in sociology, which he took a PhD there, uh, and subsequently uh, went on to become an assistant professor at the University of California in San Diego, where he now resides. Um, he's published a number of articles in a number of journals, uh, including the American Sociological Review, uh, Social Problems in Theory and Society, um, and I assume that some of what he's been presented today will be part of a book forthcoming. Uh, he's also the editor of a very good book on ethnography called Beyond the Case, according to Abramson. The, the title of uh, Beyond the Case, The Logics and Practices of Comparative Ethnography. So he's been at this for a while, and he's thought a great deal about the method as well as the substance. The title of his lecture today. Uh, is Sons, Daughters, and Sidewalk Psychotics, Madness, and Inequality in Los Angeles. Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Neil Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks for Jeff for organizing. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, and yes, it's absolutely a pleasure to be back here uh, because, as Martin noted, I was both a student and then a teacher at the Center for Ethnographic Research. Um, and it's, you know, it's a pivotal part of my book. So today I'm going to be discussing a portion of my book, um, which is correct, Sons, Daughters, and Sidewalk Psychotics, which is forthcoming with the University of Chicago Press. It is a comparative ethnography of intensive psychiatric services in two very different kinds of community treatment settings. Public safety net care in downtown Los Angeles and elite private care in West LA. And the book is about two ways of doing treatment that emerge to address problems once addressed by the psychiatric asylum. So 50 years ago, the United States had a straightforward tool for dealing with serious mental illness. A person is deemed a threat to the social order, whether dangerous or merely disruptive, families and local officials could have them blocked away. And whether warehoused in public asylums or tended to in upscale private hospitals, the problem, so to speak, could be disappeared. And then we had the process known as psychiatric institutionalization. So both the closure of state psychiatric hospitals and the civil libertarian turn in mental health law. And we're still talking about closing the asylum today in the aftermath, because in some sense, we never truly replaced the asylum. People diagnosed with serious psychiatric disabilities will spend most of their time outside of the hospital walls. Yet what community care means, uh, the kinds of lives that can effectively or profound stratified by social class. And just to use some background, this book didn't start out as a comparative ethnography. So my master's and dissertation field work uh, as a graduate student began with two and a half years with the LA County Department of Mental Health. And as I followed them dealing with patient homelessness and criminalization, 
uh, and the general problems of urban poverty, I'm again asked a series of counterfactual questions. So what if the programs had enough resources? What if the clients hadn't been homeless for years? So in my search for comparison, I thought I might do something like go to Sweden or another strong European welfare state. And then I just learned I could go across town. Uh, a UCLA psychiatrist introduced me to the elite private case management program that up here I call the actualization clinic. And I spent the next two years as an intern there uh, with them, but then also visiting elite providers that they worked with. And what I found was that despite significant differences between these types of clinics, they indeed shared some dilemmas that had emerged with psychiatric institutionalization. And today I'll be focused on this one. How can authorities manage madness when people have the rights to refuse or shape their care? And what I found empirically was puzzling given prevailing theories of care and control. Poor patients given a kind of autonomy, while the rich were therapeutically disciplined and micromanaged. And in a few minutes, I'll offer a roadmap to outline the structure of the talk. And just to get us into the logic of the comparison, I'm going to tell you about two men in these systems and set up what's noteworthy in these systems of care and control. So in many ways, these men look quite similar. Rick and Joshua are both white men in their 40s living in Los Angeles who don't think they're mentally ill, but their clinical teams believe they're suffering from delusions of their impending deaths. One is poor and the other is rich and they're processed in very different ways. Rick is a client of the LA County Department of Mental Health, which I'll be calling DMH, uh, and, forth, and he was first treated for schizophrenia while he was incarcerated. Uh, he was then homeless on the street before the DMH team and a nonprofit got him into a subsidized apartment. And one day at the clinic, Rick confided in me that he believed his neighbors had filmed him through the wall with an infrared camera while he was masturbating and distributed photos of this throughout the area. And now he believed a local father was going to try to kill him for being a pervert. Uh, so Rick's primary concern was getting out of his subsidized apartment and moving somewhere else, but he had a problem, which was that his housing voucher was tied to the building. He couldn't take it on the open market. And so the DMH team sees a crisis when he says, if you can't help me move, I will prepare to defend myself. So now let's contrast that with Joshua, who's a wealthy white client at the elite private team, the actualization clinic. And his family brought him in because he was convinced he was dying of AIDS despite numerous HIV negative tests. And the seemingly paranoid that I mentioned was that he was convinced his wealthy family had paid off all the doctors in town to um, keep his, what he saw as his real HIV status secret um, and protect the family name. And his problem was that no one would give him the medications he wanted. And the clinic sees a crisis in their terms when he says, if you can't help me uh, get the medication cocktail I need, I'm going to fly to Switzerland for assisted suicide. And 50 years ago, the primary tool for the state or families to deal with such crises might have been long-term hospital confinement. But today we see something different. So DMH does secure a brief hospitalization. But it's only about a 72 hour hold and then Rick is back out on the street. Uh, he's prescribed antipsychotic medication, but he refuses it, and they respect his refusal. And so they begin to work with the tools at their disposal. They begin to move him around to try to help him avoid his seemingly imaginary killer. So I go with them, we take him to a motel, then he goes to a uh, sober living home. Sorry to interrupt, for just one sure. second. Um, oh. A Zoom audience that is to me, you could just do this. Oh, sure. <laughs> How is that? Is that coming through better than someone? I don't see it anymore. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good enough. All right. So I'm talking about these two men with their seeming delusions of their impending deaths. So, Rick, um, so as I mentioned, briefly hospitalized, he refuses antipsychotics. Uh, the treatment team says, That's your right. And being a boom around. So we go, I go with them, take him to a motel, he's there for a while, so the living home, which he doesn't really like because he likes to drink. And then finally to get his about his housing voucher reprocessed. So uh, it can be moved, he can be moved, and he ends up living in a new apartment, and it's a successful outcome. So he uh, holds up and starts drinking again, but he doesn't think someone's come to kill him. Uh, but the treatment team worries because they say, Well, what's to stop you know this delusion from coming back? Uh, so now what happens? Uh, at the actualization clinic with Joshua. So he uh, had also been hospitalized in the past. This time, uh, they can't secure hospitalization, but they're doing something different. Uh, this is where the case is diverse. Psychotic medication again, but they worked with him and his family to try to convince him to take it again. His Buddhist psychologist, in his terms, gets real existential 
with Joshua. They do therapy on the meaning of death. And the Eastern conception is the mind body connection to try to maybe show him how maybe his experience of physical symptoms is tied to the psyche. Joshua's psychiatrist, who's also a psychoanalyst, comes up with an interesting interpretation, which is that Joshua's father's recent death, combined with Joshua's um, uh, repressed homosexual desires, have come together to create a delusion that he's dying for AIDS. Now, what do we make of such a psychoanalytic interpretation? It leads to another kind of psychosocial intervention, which is that they bring in the owner of the actualization clinic, who's an older man who they think could perhaps serve as a kind of replacement father figure through this process. And then when Joshua begins to disengage from treatment, the team tells his family to leverage it. What they mean by this is you either retract money or you retract affection uh, to try to like push the person back into treatment. And so the result of all of these different kinds of intervention is a different kind of success. So he begins, he resumes in a psychotic, he does all this therapy, and he starts to say, oh, maybe I don't have days. And he goes uh, with the team's encouragement back to work part-time at the family business. Um, so there's a success here, but they also worry because he sort of soon says, oh, I'm sorry, let me change this slide. You see my Freud and my, my Buddha. Um, they're saying they don't know what's going to happen, right? He disengages from therapy again. So what's going on here? Besides the obvious fact that rich people just get more stuff. So first consider that both Rick and Joshua, despite being deemed delusional, are liberal subjects of rights and responsibilities. There are strongly institutionalized civil liberties, which mean that rather than looking at simple coercion, what we're seeing are different forms of choice architecture in the context of voluntary services. And so let's just contrast these approaches to choice, care, and control. So the county honors Rick's choices. They respect his right to refuse medication, to drink, and to be idle, and they use the main tool for disposal, which is defensive housing, to try to sort of move him around to a place where he could pull up and drink again. Now, Rick is, of course, constrained by poverty, but otherwise, he's given a great deal of violence. The actualization clinic, on the other hand, sought to transform Joshua's choices to constrain them. They worked to convince him to take medication again and subject his desires to scrutiny and psychoanalysis and Buddhist therapy to try to figure out ways to leverage him. And they encourage him to work again at the family business and in the most literal sense to kind of paternalistic intervention and try to give a man in his 40s a new father figure. So, given that both teams must respect patient rights and claim to believe in client choice, what explains these divergent approaches? A tolerant public model of freedom for the poor versus a private disciplinary model for the rich. This defies both our usual intuition when it comes to inequality and freedom, the basic idea that poor people get control, rich people are given free reign, and I'll explain it a bit, it also defies. Theoretical expectations that are basically aligned with that. And so here's this roadmap for the rest of the presentation. I'm going to talk about this historically, tell you how we got here, I'm going to set it up as a theoretical puzzle. And the bulk of the talk is going to be comparative data and analysis. So, how these kinds of clinical cases diverge uh, the, uh, at the organizational level, and then explanatory factors to account for it. And then I'll conclude with both theoretical and policy implications. So, how did we get here? I can't give you the whole history of methods here. Let's look at the kind of tools of the asylum era. Uh, relatively easy access to civilly committed people in the hospitals. And then, as we've learned from both ethnographers and historians of the asylum, uh, within the hospital walls, rather direct coercion, uh, the, the possibility of things like uh, ECT, lobotomy, if, uh, against people's wills. And this is all behind closed doors and goes relatively like questions. Then in the 1960s, these practices come under a sustained attack. So in popular culture with one flew over the cuckoo's nest, in sociology, Erna Goffman, Thomas Sheff, and others, and then certainly Michel Foucault's notion of the uh, psychiatric hospital as a kind, kind of gigantic moral imprisonment. And so for Foucault, there's this idea of you know, replacing physical chains with uh, you know, insidious psychological chains. So it's a very countercultural 1960s reading. And this all dovetails with Physical crisis. So, psychiatric institutionalization. Hospital closure was a part of pretty strange bedfellows. Civil libertarians who believed that mad people were also entitled to freedom, and fiscal conservatives who saw the hospital costs as, uh, as excessive. So, if we consider something like the 1967 California Medical Short Act, which um, essentially ends long term uh, course of hospital confinement outside of criminal justice venues. Of two very different ways of looking at it. <coughs> so, uh, where civil libertarians declared a Magna Carta for the mentally ill, Ronald Reagan talked about his plans to close the biggest hotel chain in the state. So, we can see something like institutionalization as simultaneously a moment of 
civil liberties achievement and major welfare state retrenchment. And so we have a society that had a series of practical tools for managing madness, and that are tied to the ability to combine people within physical institutions and to make them do things. And then this is lost. Awesome. So what's going to fill the vacuum? And there are numerous issues which seem relatively obvious in the asylum era, which then are suddenly problematized. And I'm going to talk about two of them today, which is where should symptomatic people live and how should authorities manage their choices. And literature on the control of psychiatric patients from the 1980s onward has taught us a great deal about their experiences that transform institutional landscape. So it's often addressing mental illness in the context of deviance more broadly, especially in terms of homelessness and addiction. So we know about these brief emergency hospitalizations that rapidly kick people back to the street. We know about uh, what gets called the institutional circuit, where people are bouncing between jail, shelter, hospital. Um, and then we also have learned a lot about these kind of hybrid forms of criminalization and medicalization. What some people call strong arm rehab, therapeutic policing, people being uh, pushed into care under threat of arrest, or these kind of punitive cares, forms of care. I also just know that a lot of people with serious psychiatric disabilities are incarcerated. And much of this work is framed under the Foucaultian, Foucaultian notion of disciplinary power, with surveillance and the goal of internalizing social control. And for neo Foucaultians like Nicholas Rose, it's part of this larger agenda of rendering people self governing subjects who will choose responsibly. So, the classic example here would be something like welfare to work programs. And in the particular case of contemporary mental health, there's a discourse of recovery, which is about increasing independence from services until people fully recover. And it's a hopeful vision that people will not be dependent. The critique of this is that there's a kind of economic edge where the idea is that uh, people will no longer need heavy service investment and therefore we can cut uh, those services. And then there's finally just the possibility that poor people who engage in, again, the sense of behaviors behaviors uh, will simply be banished from certain parts of the city or left to die in zones of social abandonment. So, Given this literature, let me rephrase what's puzzling about my thesis. So why does the public safety net program go against theories of disciplinary social control by tolerating deviant behavior in subsidized housing and stealing really any pressure for core clients to work? So people aren't either being disciplined, nor are they being fit. And on the other hand, why do the elite private programs go against assumptions of indulgence of the wealthy by enforcing therapeutic discipline, micromanaging behavior, and pushing wealthy clients to do productive activity like working? It sounds a bit like what we expect the state to do to poor people. And here's my argument in a nutshell. What we're seeing in these clinical regimes is two class ways of solving problems in very different contexts. And they cohere to two logics that can help us understand the surprise of autonomy for the poor and the discipline for the rich. So my argument is that when mental health care is bound up in projects from poverty governance focused on removing problem people from public space, it leads to what I call tolerant containment. So this is a general acceptance of deviance with few efforts at clinical transformation so long as people remain relatively unobtrusive. Rather than surveillance, scheduling, and the substantive transformation of subjects via disciplinary tactics in the Sukodian sense, the programs I observe are aiming for basic management of harm. They concede a certain degree of medication noncompliance and consider continued substance abuse and idleness is basically inevitable. Recovery in practice is defined as keeping people out of jail, off the streets and from triggering too many 911 calls. And this requires certain kind of choices that people need to make uh, in order to meet this standard. And this all derives uh, from this kind of continued legacy of civil libertarianism and fiscal austerity that stems from psychiatric institutionalization. Now, on the other hand, when mental health care serves in a context of governing for elite families, I'm calling family systems governance, it can lead to what I call concerted constraint. So here I'm putting the social control scholarship dialogue with what might at first appear, uh, appear kind of distant research, which is another Rowe's work on cultural logics of parenting on social class. So for Rowe, where the poor and working class have a natural growth approach, believing, quote, as long as they provide love, food, and safety, their children will grow and thrive, upper middle class and upper class families invest in what you call the concerted cultivation of privileged children, emphasizes strict scheduling, surveillance, and the development of individual capabilities. So here I'm theorizing certain constraint as the mobilization of therapeutic resources to control and develop adult children. And recovery here is defined in a very different way. Recovery here is about people pursuing class appropriate activities. For instance, going back to college after a psychotic break or starting a respectable hobby. And this requires very different kinds of ways of managing choice than in the public safety net. 
to say a bit about the primary clinics I studied, uh, these community treatment teams have a shared history in the institutionalization. Uh, in the 1970s, there was this idea to create what people were calling hospitals without walls, these kind of interdis interdisciplinary community case management programs. Um, but these two have developed kind of differences in organizational form. So at DMH, you have a client to staff ratio of about 16 to 1, which is excellent for the public sector, compared to about 8 to 1 in actualization. At DMH, uh, uh, the field based case managers, three of eight had. Uh, some sort of master's degree, primarily, so, primarily social work, others had maybe some college. At actualization, all 10 of the field based case managers had a master's degree, primarily in marriage and family therapy. Funding is very different, so DMA has different kinds of state funding streams. At actualization, it's primarily just families paying cash because these types of programs usually won't accept insurance. So, for this kind of like outpatient home visits, you're looking at about $6,000 a month. When people go into high end residential care, you're looking at maybe 30,000 plus, so it's a lot of money. And then you have these different kinds of client classification requirements. So at the Department of Mental Health, the person who needs diagnosis is a serious illness, a sudden district homelessness to be over hospital discharge. At the actualization clinic, there's really no classification requirement, it's just a question of whether one's family can pay for it. So I'd say a bit about case selection. So, so why these kind of extreme cases? It's something people often ask me. And it's actually something I found empirically. Uh, so when I was moving, as I mentioned, from studying the county department of mental health to thinking like, what's a more privileged case look like? I learned that there really are not a lot of good options for people in the middle class. Uh, it's this kind of hyper unequal care market. Uh, you have you know fancy things for rich people, and then you have the public safety net. But private insurance typically will not cover things like community-based case management, which is considered the gold standard of community mental health care. And so I get meetings that for like the National Alliance for Mental Illness and Family Support Meetings, and middle class families would talk about this struggle to figure out how do I access care? Do I take my loved one off of private insurance and try to access them through the county, or do we take a second mortgage in our home or something and try to go into debt to pay for private care? So it's actually a highly bifurcated care market. Then there's also the analytical advantages um, to this kind of stark comparison in that the dynamics and mechanisms are rendered more visible. And certainly one can argue this, this limits empirical generalization. These are not typical cases, um, but that stark contrast aids in theory generation. So I earlier identified some key tension points that become problematic in the turn from hospital confinement to community-based treatment, which I'm not going to address as they point out in these different terms. So let's start with this issue of living arrangements. <laughs> how do teams approach uh, housing for people who are symptomatic and or using drugs or alcohol? So the Department of Mental Health, the key goal is ending that institutional search of people moving between homelessness, jails, shelters, uh, and hospitals. And so one of the key tools at the disposal is low barrier housing. They've adopted what's known as the housing first model. So it's a harm reduction oriented intervention. They don't require sobriety or psychiatric compliance. The idea is to put a person into independent housing, no strings attached. And so on the ground, this means independent housing for people who had often been subjected to pretty harsh regimes in the past. And so suddenly that person might be psychotic uh, and still using drugs and find themselves in an independent apartment. So how do providers make sense of this? Uh, because certainly some clinicians uh, who come from an older model were, were very skeptical. Here's what the, the team leader, the DMA supervisor Laura said to uh, a skeptical nurse. Well, at least these people are safe in these apartments. People like them are not gonna do what we want. Well, what can we do? And these are the behaviors that kept them in the streets. Now other people, because there's just not enough vouchers, uh, we'll be living in places that have rules, right? They'll be living in boarding care homes, which uh, uh, have the kind of psychiatric group homes that have uh, you know, medication management and free meals and you know, shared rooms, or they'll be living in board, excuse me, so living homes. But as I learned, they're what people call flat houses. And these are highly unstructured homes with few activities. And they end up doing a kind of de facto harm reduction because they simply don't have enough staff to enforce their rules. So, and this is one of the benefits of doing ethnographic work is that you see this discrepancy between what people say and what's actually happening. So I was at this board and care home and I was in pretty late uh, and people were just openly getting high and drinking. And when I talked to the board and care owner later, here's what he said. Well, do we have rules that say you're not supposed to be drinking? Yeah, so I don't have a guard standing in front of each room 24 hours a day, smelling if they smell any alcohol in anybody's breath, not possible. So the policy justification is, is, is a bit different, which is that the idea is like getting all people with serious mental health problems off the street saves a lot of money. 
because then they're not running out ER bills or in jail. And so this is why you actually end up seeing housing first become policy for common sense under the Bush administration at the VA with some of these sort of big bond measures like in Los Angeles uh, from about five years ago. And just to get a sense of how organizationally important this is for the Department of Mental Health, uh, this is the first line about these adult programs, the most intensive uh, uh, outpatient program at the County Department of Mental Health. So this is 2012, right before I started field work. So I'm reading this thing. The first line about the adult program says this. Since inception, adult programs have demonstrated a 67% decrease in homelessness and a 35% decrease in jail days. Now, this is very impressive, but I just want to point out that the Department of Mental Health is not a housing organization and they are not a penal diversion program. They're the Department of Mental Health. So the fact that they're not talking about symptom reduction or quality of life is very telling. You also see this when you just like think about what housing means in these higher end places for rich people. So at actualization, the problem isn't that clients are homeless. The problem is that they're a disturbance or worry for their families. And so the goal isn't simply putting them in a place where they can engage in deviant behavior uh, while being safe. So in this model, it would be very poor practice to let someone who is psychotic and from drugs uh, do their own thing. So the treatment team, in fact, often begins by getting people who are highly symptomatic out of family homes or out of independent living, try to transition them perhaps to a hospital type setting or residential like a residential uh, psychiatric facility, and then transition them down to things like um, community housing settings like sober living homes. But these are very different than the sober living homes and boarding cares I saw for poor people. So in the local parlance, they get called bubble sober livings in contrast to flop house sober livings. In a bubble sober living, the idea is like you are ensconced in a bubble away from regular society. And the ones I went to, they had strict schedules and they were very, they were something top for them, right? Like vegetarian food, yoga, going to the beach, all this stuff. And um, they simply have greater capacity to control and pattern everyday life because they have more staff. And so I also learned a lot by just talking about this with people. So I started talking about the housing person harm reduction model when I was at actualization. One of the therapists had worked earlier in his career in uh, public safety and mental health care. And he goes, well, harm reduction is all the county can do. They can't control the environment like we can. And so what does this mean to control the environment? One setting I got to know, uh, it's a place I call Mountain State Gardens, is run by a Buddhist martial arts instructor. And he articulates this very interesting kind of ordering of daily life and, and creating a social order that's neither uh, indulgent nor punitive. But here's what he said. Some other programs allow the person to just take their meds, sleep in, and just kind of shuffle through life. It's not going to happen here. We're meditating every day, surfing every day, going to the gym every day. Those bipolar and schizoaffective clients can't handle any kind of complication or stress, but they flourish in a healthy rhythm. So note what he's saying. Um, the kind of thing we might see in like a harsh sober living environment for poorer people that are doing confrontation. He says, you can't do that with people with serious mental illness. You've got to create this kind of healthy rhythm for them. You also can't let them do their, you can't just leave them to their own devices or they'll shuffle through life. And so this is what people are paying for. Um, this healthy rhythm between <laughs> tolerance and pure punishment. So right, any shelter can be mean to people. What they can't do is what I call conservative restraint. And yet this kind of healthy rhythm and expensive care and tight surveillance of daily life that people are paying a lot of money for can be experienced subjectively as domination. So consider Justin's experience. Justin was a white man in his 30s, diagnosed with schizophrenia, was addicted to huffing computer cleaner. And I would see him at the actualization clinic for group therapy, and he was living at Namaste Gardens, and he just got fed up with this intensive therapeutic schedule. And he wanted more privileges to be able to walk around the beach town by himself. And I observed him, and he said uh, to this worker, you have to take a leap of faith. Let me prove it to you. We can't take a leap of faith in people's lives. So, sorry. so that's what the worker said. We can't take leave of faith in people's lives. And the worker told me on the side later, he thought that if Justin was left up to his own devices, he would become a psychotic street person. So they had to continue to try to control him. So Justin, uh, that evening, he runs away. He gets high. He's, a, he's picked up by the police on the beach. He says he's suicidal. He's taken to the hospital. He eventually ends up back at Nile State Gardens. And I was out with him volunteering. This is one of the kind of healthy activities you're supposed to do during the day. Um, and he turns to me and he goes, Neil, you kind of get, you kind of can't get out of Namaste. Which is a very bizarre statement because Namaste Gardens is a voluntary uh, so living home. Actualizations, intensive outpatient program is a voluntary program as well, but he feels trapped. 
So we have housing, I was just mentioning that it's either about just getting people off the street or housing is about creating this kind of healthy rhythm. So now we're going to turn this issue of choices. What does it mean to offer and manage choices when people are legally empowered but are legally mad? So here's the question, is if you're going to be allowed to be deviant and do nothing, or are pushed and incentivized to be active and class appropriate? So again, in what I'm calling a tolerant containment model at DMH, the emphasis is primarily on housing. So this means that the key actor people are oriented to is landlords, and preventing eviction is a key goal. And this means that instead of trying to fix behavior, fix behavior, it's often about trying to redirect it. So as an example, Sandy was a white woman in her 40s who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, they got her into her own new apartment, and she repetitively banged her head on the wall she shared with her neighbor. Her neighbor is paying market rate. He is like fed up. He calls the building manager, and they threaten to evict her. So I go with her social worker, and the plan becomes, um, because they, they, she won't take antipsychotic medication, and they don't have like some sort of behavioral or therapeutic program for her, the plan becomes for her not to bang her head on the wall she shared with her neighbor, but bang her head on the wall that goes out to the street. So at least they can prevent the eviction. So here's what Laura, the team leader, says, uh, not specifically about Sandy, but about this kind of approach. She says, we're not so good at the rehabilitative side. It's no one's fault, really. It's just once we've covered the basics with one person, we have to move on to the next person to get them housed. And so long as people are staying housed, they have the right to do nothing. Um, so as an example, Connor was a white man in his 50s, diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, I went with the nurse Vic to check up on him. And he refused to come out of the board and carry. He says, I don't want to talk to him. And Vic says, that's fine. So as we walk away, Vic turns to me and he says, well, we made eye contact, so we can bill for it. Last week, he didn't even want to come back to stay here. So hey. So if we notice what Vic is oriented to, so one thing, certainly, right, is like, what's the minimum contact we can do to build Medicaid? Um, but moreover, look, the guy uh, is staying in the housing. We don't have a problem here. And then sometimes this kind of low barrier housing and the housing first model does precisely what it's supposed to do. It gives people safety and the space to chill out and they come to work on their issues on their own. So uh, as a, an example of this kind of success story, uh, Janie is an African-American woman in her 50s. She was only diagnosed with schizophrenia at age 50 uh, in state prison after you know, 30 years on the street uh, as a street-based sex worker with a serious crack addiction. She's been hearing voices her whole life. And so she gets diagnosed and then she's like, released to the streets. And DMH works a miracle. They get her into her own apartment. And then Janie kind of seems to work a miracle of her own, which is that she suddenly reduces her crack usage from daily to weekly. Now, here's what Carlos, her case manager, had to say. Janie still hits the pipe, but recreationally, not professionally anymore, 20 times a day. And, you know, it sounds like he's making fun of her. I mean, he's making a joke out of it. But he's very excited because he cares about Janie and he's worked really hard. Um, to get her into this apartment. And they're, they're excited to see that she's substantially reduced her crack usage. And so when I talked to Janie about it, here's what she said. Well, now I can sit here and watch TV. And then the other one, the temporary housing, I didn't even watch TV. When I was in jail, I didn't watch TV. And so what she was telling me about was like, yeah, she now felt safe and she had entertainment. And now she would, for fun, see her friends once a week to smoke crack with them in the park. And to go back to the sort of Leroux language, uh, natural growth approach, uh, there is natural growth here, but I want to point out that it's what I'm calling the incidental achievement of natural growth. Is it incidental to the model? So Carlos is not doing a therapeutic intervention. He is a housing specialist. That is his title. And he's very excited, and everyone's excited that this has happened. Um, but it wasn't a therapeutic intervention. It was about getting her off the street. And then, of course, not everyone is going to be a natural growth case. People enter into housing with serious disabilities and addiction compounded by years of uh, trauma. Some people will just drink themselves to death or die because their body scars and breaking down while on the street uh, or cycling through jail on the institutional circuit. But I also want to point out this is not just pure abandonment. Um, in fact, people were often abandoned before and then they're, they're entered into this kind of housing. And even when people die, there's this focus uh, from the clinicians. So one thing is about talking about how they're at least delaying people's death, and the second is trying to give them dignity in death. So, for instance, uh, when case managers found someone dead and they were despondent, a psychiatrist said, well, this is a societal group where premature death is enormous, and you're pushing it in the other direction. And then uh, when they found another person who was dead, and the psych tech said, at least he didn't die homeless on the street. Okay, so how do they think about managing uh, problematic choices of actualization? And I can tell you they're not into letting people be psychotic and high on their own. 
They're not into letting people do nothing, and they're certainly not into you know, watching people die on their watch. And so again, we can learn a lot from the contrast. So here's what Dev, a case manager, said. And he had done his social work internship at a prominent housing first program in the community mental health center. And here's what he said um, about why he saw them as they were very, you know, they're very good at what they did, but they were undesirable from a private perspective. He said the housing first programs don't care if you don't take meds, even if you do drugs to a certain extent. They're more kind of about keeping you out of prison, keeping you out of the revolving door of hospitalizations. It's ultimately their goal. It saves the county a lot of money. What if you want more than that for your loved one? And from Dad's perspective, if you want more than that for your loved one, you can't let them do what they want. You have to control them. So, of course, people don't always want to do what their uh, family members are trying to tell them to do. And so people refuse to engage, but they're not hospitalizable. Uh, it's all about creating what the actualization clinic calls leverage. So, um, precisely because these rich people have often been quite indulged, the key is teaching families to start retracting resources, both monetary resources and uh, and love. And this kind of created deprivation can be quite effective because uh, most of these folks are pretty used to being taken care of. And the ideal is to sort of scare them straight. Uh, there's no, you know, they, they don't actually want people to become homeless when you try to kick them out. They don't actually want bad things to happen. Um, you're trying to leverage them. And here's what Stephen said. He's an um, Asian American and Jewish man at this point. He said, when I was using it, my mom really wanted me to stop because I found out I had schizophrenia. My case manager took me to Skid Row and showed me like this could easily be you. Now Stephen was terrified. He'd never seen anything like uh, like LA Skid Row, and he agreed to go back to residential mental health and addiction uh, care, and then he transitioned to Namaste Gardens, and then he was taking college classes, and they were helping him get a driver's license. And he's kind of um, and sometimes this could lead to a kind of strange domination that was unlike anything I'd ever seen in the public sector. Um, so as an example, Kayvon was a first man in his 60s diagnosed with schizophrenia, and his case manager, Deb, who we met a moment ago, um, became intent on making him have new activities to have improved quality of life, and he forced Kayvon to play soccer. Now, Kayvon believed that any new activities would actually uh, cause a catastrophic event in his brain. And so I was with him, and he was begging Deb to, to not force him to do these new activities. And Dev finally puts his foot down and says, it would be a service if I allow this to continue because it impacts the quality of your life. And so I talked to Dev about it later. He goes, well, with the private sector, I don't know if the right word is you could get away with more, but for instance, we came on, we pushed through things. But in the public, I might not be able to do that. They could think, that's not ethical. Of course, for Dev, he was the one who was being ethical because he wasn't going to let someone's delusional choices stop them from having an improved quality of life. And then, just as I've said that, uh, you know, things that things can go quite wrong in the tolerant computer model, I mean, things fail here too, they just fail in a different way. So, as, a, as just an example of this, leverage can backfire. So, for instance, one young man who was diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, his family uh, was told by the clinic to take away his car and take him out of the family home so that he would move into a treatment center and take antipsychotic medication, which he did just long enough to get his car back. Then he drove off to Texas and got arrested. And the last I heard, he was eventually, he, he came back to LA and he was eventually transferred in, into the public system. He was being outraged by a public program because the actualization clinic sort of met their wits at about what to do. And the fact that places like actualization don't have a harm reduction component means that when their leverage and concerted constraint model fail, they basically have no answer for two harsh realities, which is the chronicity of serious mental illness and the fact that like people are going to keep drinking or doing drugs. And just as, a, as an interesting example of this, um, there was this uh, a client who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was a serious alcoholic, uh, but he had his own money because he was actually uh, very successful in Hollywood. And he hired the treatment team to constrain his behavior, to follow him around and stop him from doing things like, like drinking. But then when he decided he wanted to start drinking again, he just fired the treatment team and went back to drinking. And then he ended up in the hospital, he's coming out of residential treatment and wanted to come back to community-based care. And Deirdre, the supervisor said, no. Uh, and here's how she talked about it in, case, in the case conference. Well, he has his own money, so there's no way for us to leverage him. And she later saw him on TV and said, oh, I can't believe that guy's still alive. So there's also a risk of death uh, for wealthy people too, but because they're a private clinic, they don't actually have to have people die on their watch, right? So unlike a public clinic that might have to 
try the best to delay death and then try to get people dignity in death. It's just like, um, because they're a private clinic, much, much like private schools, you just, when there are difficult cases, you just want your hands away. Okay, so I've shown these two contrasting care and social control strategies that are puzzling, giving our usual intuition regarding wealth and freedom, as well as some theories of deviance. So why are the poor given autonomy while the rich are subjected to discipline and surveillance? And I've taken us through these dimensions of community care to show these two class ways of problem solving. And we can make sense of the surprising autonomy and surprising discipline by showing them three part of these different logics. And they correspond to governing deviance for the city versus for the privileged family. So when mental health care serves the project of poverty governance, it can lead to tolerant containment and low expectations for change. So rather than for a disciplinary institution that might attempt to normalize people or render them self-governing, there's simply an acceptance of deviance. When mental health care ser serves as a form of family systems governance oriented to wealthy paying family members, it demands normalization. So this is concerted constraint, which is akin to Annette LaRoe's concerted cultivation of privileged children, but now as a form of uh, more explicit social control. And it's linked to broader ideas of family social class, respectability, and how love and obligation go hand in hand. So abstracting from the cases at hand, these offer us two general modes of thinking about liberal governments. So that social control, uh, when individual freedom is strongly institutionalized. So tolerant containment is a general strategy to mitigate deviance and disruption, and corrective social control is either uh, ineffective uh, or you know, politically problematic or just too expensive. We can see this logic in a range of cases when the local state decides to accept a certain degree of deviance. Um, basically, the tactic is to alter the threshold at which behavior is deemed problematic and limit demands on people. So we might see elements of this uh, with the surprising freedom in, in, in cases like Sanctioned homeless encampments within cities, uh, decriminalization of drugs, but without investment in rehab, uh, prison release without normalization via prison re uh, without reentry services. So, concerning constraint, on the other hand, is an attempt to keep the privilege in a separate sphere of social control. Um, so, the point isn't just avoiding criminalization, it's also about avoiding the tolerance that's visited upon the poor. So, this means there can be a surprising amount of disciplinary power. Um, the tactic here is basically spend lots of resources to try to normalize people. So we might see this in the kind of surprising control found in things like the troubled teen industry. Uh, we can imagine this perhaps in things like sex therapy for uh, residential sex therapy for celebrity predators, boarding schools, basically any case where privileged people need to have their behavior controlled, all while avoiding the things that happen to sort of regular people. And so far, I've been offering historical and sociological analysis to help explain surprising phenomena. By now, I hope I've convinced you that it's not that surprising at all. In fact, it's quite explicable once you understand accurate situations, frames, and resources. But now I want to make a transition. So, what bearing do these analytical insights have on important policy issues of the moment? And in fact, I've been trying to address this in a series of op eds on California's overlapping homelessness, mental health, and addiction crises. So, West Coast cities have become a kind of boogeyman for conservatives. The claim it shows liberalism on the mark. And we are indeed seeing things like a spatially specific acceptance of social problems. City sanctioned homeless encampments, people using drugs in the open, people in psychosis on the streets, so long as it stays sort of in the right places, it's tolerated. And where did this come from? Well, I argued in the Washington Post, California has accidentally generated a situation where people have civil liberties to be deviant, but no social rights to resources. So we've had court decisions that secure people the rights to be homeless, but no rights to housing. Martin B. Boise is a Ninth Circuit court decision that says you can't arrest people or sweep them away if you don't offer them shelter. Well, cities don't have enough money to create shelter or housing. Uh, we have the right to drug possession, but no right to rehab. California Proposition 47, uh, de facto decriminalizes low level uh, possession of even meth and heroin. Uh, it was supposed to come with addiction investments. Those don't come through. And then we have the right to refuse psychiatric care, but no right to psychiatric care. This is the long legacy of psychiatric institutionalization. So in other words, my claim is that we're seeing is tolerant containment as a kind of unintended social policy throughout the West Coast. And conservatives like New York Times columnist Brett Stevens blame this on liberals being soft on deviants, but it's just not that simple. And as I've been suggesting from this talk, it's part of this major structural accident that's replicated the logic of the institutionalization for 50 years ago. Left-leaning civil liberties organizations have made substantial legal political victories against mass criminalization. The conservative fiscal policy has made it impossible to enact root cause solutions 
essentially means cities can't govern those streets. Or as I put it in the post, if you're a little more neither left nor right would intentionally design a system that's dysfunctional. It's a Frankenstein's monster created by mating civil libertarianism with austerity. And so I've argued that without significant investments in the welfare state or various kinds of root cause solutions, these kinds of civil liberties victories will lead to power containment and a kind of stripped out version of harm reduction, or it will lead to a political backlash and the resurrection of law and order politics, which is precisely what we're seeing now uh, as cities attempt to uh, begin sweeping homeless in Canada today. And though, finally, what does this all mean for our definitions of care and doing right by people with co occurring disabilities and addiction? So, one thing is we do need to spend way more money to build up our treatment and housing infrastructure. I mean, maybe we can't offer you know, every person a $10,000 a month therapy farm or $30,000 a month uh, dual diagnosis rehab. We have to reckon with the way that austerity has led to these treatment programs becoming a little more intolerant and containment. And in addition to massively uh, increasing funding, we need to rethink how we address these ideals of freedom and client choice. Because my research has shown me that rich people don't want libertarian freedom for their loved ones in these situations. And if one way we define uh, a good product is whether people with money try to buy it, then freedom here is an inferior good. Which isn't to say that concerted constraint, as, as, I, as I've seen it, is perfect, but this whole dynamic should give us pause. So disability scholars have long criticized what they call the hegemony of normalcy in various responses to bodily or psychic difference. So is tolerant containment here, allowing someone to be mad or keeping them relatively safe, a refutation of that hegemony, or is it just austerity-driven uh, neglect that happens to align with some ideals of client choice? And on the other hand, sociologists tend to be highly critical of tough love attempts to discipline and activate the poor. We say this is the individualization of structural inequality or the medicalization of deviance. What about tough love applied by trained therapists with promises of resources in the future directed to rehabilitate the rich person with a disability? Is that familial domination or is that just the best care money can buy? So I'm hesitant to give like definitive answers and so much of it will be contingent on implementation. But if my theoretical framework is correct, such that freedom can be an inferior good and discipline can be a form of privilege, I think it's time we rethink our normative and policy commitments in this entire arena. Uh, thank you. I look forward to comments and questions. Well, as stated uh, to start, raise your hands if you're in the queue, then I'll call you. Uh, first of all, thank you. This is amazing. Um, and then I have uh, two questions. One is uh, about empirical implications, maybe slightly out of sample, but. Can I catch Of course. Okay. Um, given um, the bifurcation of the care system that you presented, um, would I be correct in assuming that? Middle class people with a severe mental illness presumably have some of the same aspirations as the elite uh, regarding, you know, a highly disciplined and actualized self. But because of the economic structure of that um, system of care, actually funneled towards the freer, but also low expectation part of the system. So that's one question. And I know it's not you didn't study middle class families, but I, want, I was wondering if you could say whether that's a correct implication from your work. And the second one is, towards the end, you start bringing up the policy and normative implications uh, of your work. And I have a question about, in general, if you can share with your assume, fellow travelers, how you handle the normative side of your work. Like as social scientists, uh, we often have an uncomfortable yeah, relationship yeah, yeah. with normativity. We've got sort of issue taking normative stances and describing contradictions and ironies, which you do beautifully. But we sometimes also engage with normativity in more or less direct ways. One is through policy recommendation, and one is also implicitly in our rhetoric. For example, like the head banging case, which is mm -hmm. very powerful, certainly calls on our sense of moral outrage. Um, but we don't necessarily talk very much theoretically or in terms of craft yeah. about how to handle normative questions as social scientists. Great, thank you for both those questions. So, yeah, so I, it's true. I did so. I did not go, I set out to study the middle class, but I did see some of what the, what you, as you said, you've inferred here, like um, middle class families and people themselves may have aspirations towards things like, yeah, returning to college after some hard break, having this kind of actualized self. Um, it's not readily available. So I would have, I, you know, I, 
in this long enough, like I had people call me up and say like, oh, so I hear you I've interviewed so-and-so, and I was wondering, you could tell me, like, where should I go? And it's like, well, uh, have you gone to, you know, like the county or to these nonprofits? And it's like, yeah, but in order to get the intensive services there, you need to be homeless or in jail. And we, you know, we managed to keep our son out of that. So we can't access that. So you can't get intensive services there. Um, can you afford this other thing? No, we can't afford that. So you're sort of trapped. So you may just end up having the person like live in your basement, um, right? And you could imagine certainly with, uh, with proper supports, whether that's more traditional clinical ones or even peer-based support, but with something, the person might be able to have a fuller life. But in many cases, middle-class people feel quite trapped. In other cases, they will end up in the public sector services because, for instance, um, even though their loved one is housed, like maybe has been arrested a few times, and so um, they don't have to deal with the home of this component, but what those treatment programs do, if you do end up in the kind of public sector one, is like, they don't, yeah, they're not spending all this time, like, yeah, getting you ready to return to college. Um, they're too focused on the other people who are in crisis. So, so even if you are middle class and you end up in these public services, yeah, like, there's probably not going to be this huge investment in um, kind of developing people as, as people. There's just not time for it. Um, it's not that it couldn't be done, but it's just realistically, it usually can't be. Um, yeah, the normative, the normative part, this is hard. It, yeah, it was something I, I only started doing recently. Like I, I um, turned a lot more to like trying to do public writing and things and say like, here's what I think is right or, or here's what I think is wrong. And it's, it's complicated. I mean, I think, yeah, we are, we, we tend to hedge a lot. Um, and, you know, I think I, at a certain point, I, I, I just become more comfortable saying things like, Okay, so if we look at something like Foucault and Madison civilization and like this idea that, oh, you know, you unchain the people, but you put them in psychological chains. Like, like, and but yeah, I, I think that's better. Like, <laughs> it's not that it's great, right? There are problems with, like, when you look at this kind of Quaker moral treatment model where they're forcing people to perform in, in like tea parties and things. Like, yeah, there, there are reasons we can critique that. But this idea that like anything that's normalizing is inherently bad, I, I, I find that. Uh, kind of juvenile, frankly. And so like, yeah, I've, I've become more comfortable making some statements like this, but things are things are really complicated. Uh, it's, and that's like the most banal thing you could possibly say, right? Um, I'll say like the headbanging one, what, I, what I've been trying to do is really try to give voice to different perspectives. Like in, in the book I write about this, like, so one patient's right advocate who heard this story, I was talking to her, and she said, well, the county's doing a great job because for people with some psychotic disorders or on the autism spectrum, headbanging is a form of what we call stimming. So people are self-stimulating. Self it's a way to calm themselves. And so I try to take that very seriously. Like, okay, so like, yeah, you shouldn't try to stop people from stimming if that's what they need at the moment. But I don't think that that's what's happening uh, in the case I'm talking about. Um, it's not because they're trying to honor her difference or figure out what's the best intervention for her. They're trying to keep her from getting fit. Um, so my normative stance isn't like, it's always bad to let people self-stimulate by headbanging, but it should be that we've had enough resources in place for this thing that like, uh, it's not sort of predetermined by resources. And so that's sort of my normative commitment there. Like when it gets to the, the more, yeah, every individual case, the bioethics of it, um, I'm maybe less qualified to talk about that, but the sort of bigger normative thing for me is like, let's just have this well resourced enough that it's not predetermined by class of quality. Yeah. Yes, sir. Great talk. Um, I, I had one question about, and I'm glad you bring up this, um, these talks with clinicians, because I think it's um, interesting that there's this difference. You mentioned the pre, the master's, mm -hmm. the 10, and I'm wondering if you saw a difference in the kind of autonomy disciplining of the clinicians when you're seeing them like are they um is there is there other stronger sort of guidelines in one place versus the other you know because you're you know oh you have so many people you have to deal with in the public yeah. sector maybe you know do your own thing versus in the private it's like we got to be very careful here because if we do something wrong and we're not all on the same page we're going to get sued or yeah. whatever so i think there's this interesting point that you made about the kind of habitus of the backgrounds or the disciplining of the clinicians potentially yeah. and the way that they're socialized and work together. Right, thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, and some, some of your intuitions are right, but it's also, it sort of goes in a lot of directions. So um, 
So it's true that people are sort of given leeway, maybe at the county, because it's kind of like, well, we can't expect you to do much with these people. And so people can get away with sort of, you know, like fixing, like, ah, well, you know, we'll do the minimal we can to build for it, and like everything's cool. Um, but there's also, so, and then, and then in the private sector, it's true, you know, you're dealing with these wealthy families, you're scared of doing something wrong, they're very scared of information getting out. Like, I like went to some Malibu rehab where it was like, it wasn't like a big long NDA. It was like, I had to sign all this stuff. And that's just like, I mean, it happens in a different way at the county where I had to go through their kind of like live scan and IRB process. But there wasn't like this concern about individual people's names, right? Because like, no one cares about some random person who was homeless and has a psychiatric disability. They care about the, the sum of some Hollywood exam, right? Um, so there are different pressures on them. There's also this way in which I, I was kind of fascinated by this, and I don't make enough of it, but the, pri the elite private care sector is like basically completely unregulated. Um, this is true of the, like the addiction services as well. Um, when they're not taking insurance, there's basically no one monitoring them. So, you know, I, I asked uh, the owner of the actualization clinic, like, so, you know, do you get audited? He goes, I get audited by the parents every two weeks when I send them a big bill. I was like, does anyone actually like audit your, no. Uh, they're not even keeping records. Like I was trying to like compile basic numbers. You know, as photographers were always like, oh my God, people are gonna say you have, you know, you're N of one. <laughs> like, okay, I'll be like, try. they're just like art stats me. They don't have to. Um, and so th there are ways in which the, the high end sector too, um, you know, as long as they're keeping the family satisfied, like they're not under the same kinds of professional pressures. And also another thing that happens in both places is that these are the kind of jobs where people don't stick around that long. Uh, in both settings, you had people who were coming in and they were trying to get hours to like get their license. And so, you know, they might do this for a few years and then try to move into like, be a private practice therapist or move somewhere else in the county. A lot of people see downtown as kind of like, uh, yeah, like a good place to get experience, but like not a place you want to stick around. And then you have like, a few people who are like, Deeply committed leftists, where like the dream for them is to spend a career working in this good realm. Um, yeah. Well, I have a, I have a couple of comments actually. Uh, three. Uh, <laughs> uh, one is that yeah, it's complicated, but that's why they pay us to do this. So I uh, mean, otherwise there'd be no reason to have us. Um, I think the other thing I would say is that on your one. When you, your answer to one of the people about uh, this person who is banging their head, the two object, the two center points of the comment were on whether it was aiding them and they had a right to be aided. The other point was whether it was they should be evicted. But the real point is they're beating their head against the wall. That's not normal. And it could hurt them. So that's, it, the other two are kind of irrelevant. The question really becomes, really, what do you do with a person who's beating their head against the wall uh, in general in that situation? What should be actually, what should be the steps actually with someone doing that? Because the other ones are really marginal. I mean, in an economic sense, not an economist, but an economic sense. And the, set, the last one is used in the analysis something that I don't think can be sustained by even your evidence, which you used um, uh, as sort of the rule, which is a, a natural change. There is no natural, there was the, the example that was not natural at all. There's nothing natural about it. It was caused by actually environmental stuff. There was a change of environments. There wasn't anything natural about it. So. Uh, and in order for that concept to seem to be theoretically to be powerful, there'd be some idea or some definition of what natural would mean in this particular <laughs> sense, and as opposed to unnatural. In that regard. So I'm interested in your responses yeah. to these. This would be great. All right. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, I'll, I'll work backwards from you. Yeah. So no, I mean I agree. Yeah, it's it's. If you take it literally, of course, it's not really natural growth. Uh, yeah, there was a major intervention. She goes from living on the street and being uh, incarcerated right. to having her own apartment and having safety. So, yeah, I mean, I think that for Laurel, the idea, and, and of course, it's not purely natural in the sense of like parents aren't sending their kid out, you know, in the wilderness somewhere and saying like, but you know, let's see what nature does. It's like they are creating an environment, but at least in her terminology, it's natural in the sense of less intervention 
than, uh, than what's happening in these more privileged households. But of course, there's all kinds of intervention happening from the family. So I think you're right that, that conceptually, uh, that terminology, yeah, if you take it too literally, it, it falls apart. Uh, I would just riffing on it because in part because it's an established right. category. Okay, good. Um, you know, with um, yeah, so what what to do about the headbanging? You know, I on the one hand, yeah, I, I think that 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 you yeah, you could certainly try to just stop the person from headbanging. It has to say, right? It's like it's not it's not it's not normal. It's not good for them. Like, and so you could have a model if we had uh, if we had this available like legally. Where um, the, the woman could be locked up and like restrained in some fashion in a straitjacket, for instance. Yeah. Um, that's just not consonant with our ideas about civil liberties. About you know, one version of looking at her dignity is stopping her from harming herself. The other version is giving her autonomy. Where right now, as in a system like, and especially for someone in her class, where we think uh, in terms of the autonomy, because we've got nothing else really done. You know, I want to I want to like keep the tension where, like I said, that patient's rights activist is saying, in some cases, the best thing for this person is to let them continue to bang their head because it allows them to get out all of this nervous energy or you know something along those lines. I don't can't say I know enough about the subjective experience of uh, uh, of someone on the autism spectrum or with a psychotic um, uh, sort of who who feels compelled to do this to say whether or not that's good or bad. Um, I'm trying to leave that open ended, but I do think again that would you say the same thing, Neil, if they were cutting themselves with a knife? Depends on are, are, is it? Yeah, this depends. Are they are they cutting themselves to the degree where they are risking more serious injury, or is it a, a, like a relatively superficial wound and it becomes a coping strategy that's maybe not great, but it's better than some other possible coping strategy? Well, maybe, but what if it, all of the answer to that? is whether they die or not. In other words, your answer to your question on, is that you're predicated on the result. So we only know if it's bad, ultimately in the end, if somebody bleeds to death or they have some kind of, of trauma to the brain in which they have an aneurysm. So the question I have is, is that the criteria we would use to let somebody do that? In general, I mean, if you had a child, would you say, I'll let you slice yourself, or I think the state would be okay to slice yourself until I find out if it was really a major intervention, which I had to take you to the hospital and they had to have blood fusions and all the rest? Because I do think when I, when I change the, one of the things that I have with mental illness is once you change that dynamic and you put it in the physical disease world or the citadel thing, then people make more sense of it. It's just that when it's in the brain, that there's a lot of prejudice that goes on in the brain. And if we let that happen, I mean, in other words, we don't use the same criteria if it was a physical thing. I guess it's around the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess in, in, in another place where it's complicated. You know, and there becomes a question of like how much volition do people have? Like some people are arguably making a choice and they know how to, you know, stop it from getting to the point of, of, of death, or even if they do kill themselves, right? Like if we think that they're in some degree of sound mind, we can there's an argument to be made for the individual autonomy to do this kind of thing. I yeah, I don't have super firm commitments so uh, on all these specifics. Um, I mean, one thing I, I think is interesting as as you know, right? It's like, well, what if this was your child? I mean, that's kind of part of what I'm trying to document is the gestalt, gestalt switch that happens when people look at these kind of bioethical debates, when it's your child, as I say, sons or daughters, or when the person that is a cyborg psychotic, right, is someone who we've sort of stigmatized as this kind of calm person out there. And the sort of irony I'm trying to point out is that we give people the, the autonomy to destroy themselves if we don't care about them. Um, as to my, yeah, I'm still working out maybe some of my own personal commitments. Debra. Yeah, um, hi, Neil. I have a question and a comment. So the question is about um, this, you know, more on the sidewalk, psychotic end of things. Is the disciplinary model that we're more familiar with um, from, you know, kind of critical sociology and legal studies, is that still happening for the people who aren't housed mm -hmm. and who, you know, are like out of place, say? Um, so that's my question. And then my comment is, um, I thought what you were talking about about the end was really interesting about how we might 
you know, kind of the policy implications. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the ceasefire model. It's a violence um, intervention program for um, typically young, young adults, teenagers and young, young adults. And it is kind of like the concerted cultivation. It's like pouring tons of resources mm -hmm. and also leverage on, um, you know, it's about finding like the youth who are actually involved in shootings and then like really doing everything possible to, so that just might be a case that you would want to look at as, as kind of a, um, yeah, yeah. To see, uh, cause it's, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I will, I, I will look more into that. I've read a little bit about, yeah, like the, you know, like violence perfect, but I'm less familiar with this, but it, it makes a lot of sense to me, which is like, like when will the state pour a bunch of money into this kind of thing? It's something specifically like this, where it's like, you think you might be able to offset some uh, bigger disruption, right? Like, like shootings. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, and then this, I think, so I don't have a great answer, but I will look into that, so thank you. Um, ties into the first question, like, so, is there a disciplinary model? I mean, I'm not sure that the Foucaultian disciplinary model has ever been true about American prisons, right? For instance, um, and I, I was certainly not the first person to say this, right? But like, um, it's a great piece by a secret Alfred that's titled something like, what if everything Foucault had to say about prisons was wrong? And the basic idea, like, there's never been the kind of uh, normalizing practices. There's never been enough staff to do it. It's a similar thing. It's a capacity issue. So uh, the idea is that like, What's happening in, in, um, in jails, for instance, is rather than the kind of like, you know, the gaze and the surveillance, the kind of power that's at play is the power to close the door and not care when the people are brutalizing each other. I mean, that's kind of what happens. It's not disciplinary power in the kind that I'm talking about here with the sort of motivation where it's like, you know, it requires a great deal of investment. Um, I don't think American corrections, right? Like, like departments of corrections haven't been departments of corrections uh, in a long time, if ever. Is they just like it's like it requires quite a bit of resources. As far as like the people on the street, I mean, are they subjected to discipline? They're subjected to harshness. But again, I think I, I think it's I, I would make sort of the distinction between like punitiveness and disciplinary power that's about capacity building. So people still get like their encampments still get displaced, um, even be, even with things like Martin B. Boise, which make it like should be legally more difficult to do so. Um, uh, so they're displaced, they are moved around spatially, but I don't really see the disciplinary model. Um, you see it in a, occasionally you find these kind of things. So like you were mentioning with the, the heavy intervention into the, the potential shooters, you see it in some of these, occasionally you'll see this in, in um, these kind of trouble team models that end up uh, as, as jail diversions, where there is a huge influx of resources to create these kinds of very therapeutic disciplinary practices. But it's usually just too expensive, so it's not something I think we see all that much. Thanks. Um, I have a really interesting comment from Zoom that I wanted to share. Sure. With you. We have a hard time in our community health clinic deciding when it is right to 5150 someone. For example, a man on MAT who defecates on himself is on the street, smells so bad that the local shelter won't let him in, but it seems logical when you talk to him. He is at risk of amputation due to an infected foot. The local ER does not want to keep him. He lost his medical and does not go get it fixed. No family or friends. His counselor tries her best to encourage and legal services. And, oh, okay. Yeah. There's um, no question exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, I, mean, I think these are, you know, these, these are these kind of liberal dilemmas that, you know, if, if if, if one grows up in a society that's at least ostensibly obsessed with individual freedom, uh, like in you know, the United States, uh, yeah, this seems like this kind of big biological dilemma. What do we do against the person's will? They seem uh, you know, rational enough that we shouldn't be making these kind of interventions. But I think it gets back to this, this, this question about, yeah, the, the norm of decisions, like, I, I don't think we're ever going to have some sort of clear, rational, or scientific way of deciding when it's appropriate to to 5150 50, 50, someone, or you know, for a 72 hour hold, or to put them in an asylum. I mean, that's just like a kind of ethical and political decision you have to make. Uh, you know, this idea that there's an algorithm for it, I just don't think there, there is. Um, I mean, I can tell you like one thing I've been thinking about a lot is like, like uh, I should have been working on uh, writing about this with, with Alex Bernard, who was a 
Berkeley sociology PhD, um, who's now at NYU. And one of the things we've been talking about is like kind of like a new compromise around civil liberties, which is that there may need to be more court ordered treatment, for instance. But the way we split the difference is that the whole system shouldn't be uh, designed by the people who are trying to bring back forced care, it should actually be designed by other patient activists who are against forced care. And so, like, we should do things like hire, um, you know, like user experience design people or architects to like work with ex patients who hated their last hospitalization to figure out how do you build a psych ward that's not totally alienating. Um, there's still going to be people who are going to say, like, I'm being dominated by putting, being placed in this nice hospital. And then at a certain point, I'm going to say, yeah. Um, and that might be a, it's still not, it's like there's no good answer to a lot of these questions. There's going to be something bad that happens, whether that's the violation of somebody's autonomy um, or leaving them to die on the street. And so, yeah, my, I, I don't know. I don't, yeah, I don't know if not the specifics of this one to really say what the right thing to do is, but um, yeah, that's sort of like at least my new idea of how to balance the civil liberties and uh, need for care kind of. Kind of debates. Anybody else? I have a question. You might be a little open ended, but let's go for it. Um, how, like, what do you think this kind of civil libertarian model would look like if it was divorced from the austerity that came along mm -hmm. with it? Um, and would it veer more towards the sort of like, um, what you call it, the conservative control model, or would it maybe even have more resources focused still a lot on autonomy, but somehow find you know, like more supportive services yeah, yeah. to have better outcomes. Like, I don't know, does that seem like that would work or do you think it kind of comes maybe more out of the austerity itself? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I'm trying to envision like what, what this would look like if you had like this real commitment to uh, client choice and, and, and a lot of these ideals of harm reduction, right? Kind of like the cooler, older activist version of harm reduction, not the austerity harm reduction. Um, and I think there could be elements that could be really good. Like I actually think things like housing first are great. Um, it's just the problem is that that's sort of where it ends. People sort of joke about like housing first, housing last. Like here's a place to stay, and then that's it. Um, but you can imagine a very well resourced version of that approach. Yeah, that like gets a person their own place, helps them feel safe, and then just like someone shows up every day and is like, hey, like can I help you with anything? And for the first month, they're the like, fuck you, get away from me. And then after a while, like maybe they build a friendship and um, and it can work really well as opposed to how it is right now, which is like with a lot of these community treatment programs, like the California Mental Health Services Act, full service partnerships, I think it's like once someone says, I don't want these services anymore three times, then you, you drop the case. What really should be happening is like, you say, oh, okay, well, I'll come back tomorrow. And the person's like kind of annoyed at you. And it's like, again, it's sort of splitting the difference between um, uh, uh, abandoning them, and uh, so you're, you're not you're not like forcing things on them, but you're just showing up and saying, "Hey." And so hopefully, you know, maybe some version of that could could work. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it would play out. But yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Um, I had, I guess, another line of question, which was, did you see differences in outcomes in the care um, of the public clinic based on the person's, you know, level of education, their status, you know, whether if, if, if some middle class people are getting filtered in to the system, they might have a different yeah. reaction yeah. to the disciplining if it was offered or they might ask for more X, Y, Z. So yeah. like, did you see any variation there? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the first thing is like, yeah, if they are a middle class person and they're coming in, and maybe one, then maybe they already have housing, um, and so that doesn't become like the immediate thing that everything gets focused on. And perhaps their families are involved. Uh, but a, a big difference too here is that in many cases, uh, you know, people would say, "I don't want my family involved at all," and they kind of would say, "Okay, then like we're not going to talk to them." Um, that is, you're right. It's a very different situation when the families are paying and they're true client. Um, so did I see differences in, in, in outcomes? Yes, to a degree, again, in the sense that like, you could spend more time with somebody focused on things like, you know, helping them feel more comfortable going outside. If you didn't have to worry about homelessness and things like that. But in a sense, that person will not really be a priority case to spend time on, um, at, at least like that the DMH clinic I was at, because you have so many other fires to put out. Um, 
Right, so I did, I did meet some people, right, who's, who, who were middle class and they, you know, you have these stories of like people who it's like, oh, I bought the best private insurance I could think of, I could, I could find, and then it all went wrong because then my sister would just go to psychiatrists and get and get amphetamines from them, you know, with our good private insurance. And then she becomes psychotic again. You have these kinds of, kind of situations. And then they're able to move their family member eventually into something like uh, one of these community case management teams. Um, and yeah, like they'll probably do, the person will probably be doing better because they do have a lot more social support. But as far as like, yeah, again, getting it to the point where like they're going to go back to Ivy League University, like maybe. But yeah, it wasn't really something I was seeing. It just wasn't a focus.